couple of light bulb moments that uh, that changed the way we thought and and helped us see things in a better light. And then uh, where we are today, hopefully uh, some of this um, some of this data will, will will give you guys the confidence to jump in with both feet and, and put your head down and, and plow forward uh, through the tough times. But hopefully it'll give you um, some some motivation to keep your feet moving when when it does get tough and you get some resistance or some pushback to to help you understand that uh, the the bite the the, fa the fight and the battle and the uh, conviction to do what's right for little kids and to help share your sport with kids um, uh, is definitely worth the worth the work and then where we're heading in the future um, so with that I'll move on to to my next screen here. Um, Pre-ADM for USA Hockey, the challenges that we were seeing, uh, we had declining youth registrations, we had declining youth retention rates, and our world ranking uh, in our international competitions was very concerning to us. Um, youth hockey model in the United States in the early 2000s, we had an adult competition model. We did not have an age-appropriate uh, model based on any sports science or based on any um, appropriate development model uh, that was out there. We were just um, uh, training our young players as we would train uh, our higher higher end elite players, and our coach education wasn't focused on age appropriateness, and our, definitely our leadership wasn't thinking about uh, young kids and young kids hockey and uh, developing a passion and, and age appropriate development. That's for sure at that point in the early 2000s. We had a, uh, a model where our young players overcompeted and undertrained. Um, we had a training focus on the immediate outcome. So most of our teams, coaches, parents, clubs, leagues were focused on this Saturday's game versus uh, a long-term plan. And we have the saying that we were, we were focused on winning the race to the wrong finish line. And by no means was there any uh, discussion or any um, any program in place to focus on windows of trainability. Uh, they weren't being considered at all, unfortunately, at that point. Uh, retention issues. We talked about our eight and under player retention was declining since 2000. Um, and 20% were dropping out after one season. 43% dropped out by the time they were nine years old and 60% dropped out before 11 years old. So uh, some of this was overshadowed by uh, the overall growth of USA Hockey, in the, especially in the adult membership category and the girls' women's category, so it was um, it was disguising the reality of our of our membership numbers. And so the balance sheet in the bottom right hand corner of the ledger looked okay. We were flat, but we were okay with uh, with some very small percentage of growth. But when you really peeled back the onion and looked at the youth program, we had these uh, very, very significant re retention issues. So what was causing those? Um, that finally came to light. And then our world ranking, you can see on this slide, we were ranked number seventh. And we had a, uh, you know, a country with 300 million people. We're ranked behind Slovakia. Slovakia, uh, Colorado has more uh, youth hockey players than the whole country of Slovakia. Um, Sweden. Finland, Czech Republic, um, Massachusetts, New York, Michigan, Illinois, Minnesota alone had more players than those whole countries did, but yet they were outperforming us on international um, uh, events. So pre-ADM, um, what, what did our registrations look like? And more importantly, uh, what, did the, uh, what was the financial impact to, to our company? Um, as you can see here, in 2000, 2001, we had a total youth uh, registration number of 366,000. Uh, a few years later, in 2000, 2008, we had dropped in total youth registrations to 345,000. So we were down about 6% there. Over here in the eight and under category, which is the base of our, bill, of our business and the base of our future, uh, we had 98,000 players. But you can see just uh, six years later, we were down to 91,000 players. So obviously trending in a negative way. Um, not a lot of talk or recognition of this, quite frankly, within our organization. But when you looked at it, you see the financial impact. And uh, I'd like to point out that, yes, we're, we were a nonprofit, but 
we weren't going to be in business as a nonprofit very long if we continued to trend in that direction, and we sure weren't going to uh, rectify our international um, competitiveness or lack thereof uh, if we continued to trend in this direction. So uh, obviously uh, pretty gloomy uh, in about 2007, 2008. Uh, so we, it, we did wake up and we said, what can we do? So some critical um, uh, points along the timeline here. In 2007, Ken Martell and I attended uh, a USOC uh, youth sport conference over um, in Colorado Springs here, and we met Isvan Baye. And Isvan introduced us to long-term athlete development uh, principles and the, the whole idea of that and age appropriateness and age-specific programming and windows of trainability. He invited Ken and I to, uh, to Calgary to attend uh, a long-term athlete development summit. We met Dr. Stephen Norris. And quite frankly, those two guys are the, are the two that really set this ball in motion for, uh, for USA Hockey. We, uh, we got really excited by what we saw in Calgary. Uh, quite frankly, every single uh, governing body of, of Olympic sport was at this conference, and they were all required to have a long-term athlete development plan submitted uh, to Sport Canada in order to get their, their funding. We looked around the room, Ken and I said, you know what, it's really interesting because these guys uh, are all going through this battle and uh, trying to implement this long-term athlete development strategy, and um, we really didn't know others back in the United States that, um, that we could commiserate with and maybe work with collaboratively uh, to put our plan together. But also, um, we did look across the fence to Canada and say it's pretty impressive that all of those sports are working to get together uh, for the benefit. Now, let's not be misled or misunderstood. A lot of this was driven by the government uh, um, to get kids more active, have a healthier society. Uh, the, the positive impact it would have on um, on their medical system. Um, so it was twofold, uh, a healthier society, but also creating um, more athletic kids, more um, uh, active kids, but also hopefully produce more elite players out of the top of that pyramid. So um, we stayed in touch with Isvan and, and, and Dr. Norris. Those two guys uh, said, sure, we'll help you guys if you guys put it together. In fact, Steve Norris's point when I said to him, I said, really, of all the sports asking for your help in the United States, it's ice hockey. Will, will Sport Canada and Hockey Canada, will they, will they really allow you to be involved with USA Hockey uh, to put together a plan that might improve our system down here? And Steve, I'll never forget his words. His words were, you know what? Um, I go around and I talk. I give a lot of presentations. He said, what well, my real mission is, is anybody that's really going to do something, I'm willing to help. So that is, um, that's resonated with us, and it's kind of been our philosophy as well. Um, in fact, last week I was, um, we, had, we rescheduled this call, as, as you guys know, and I had just been in Belgium, and I was in the Czech Republic because those guys uh, had raised their hand, and they wanted, to, they wanted to, to understand what we were doing as well. So we, we kind of try to share that same philosophy as help the ones that want to be helped. We're not experts like these two guys are by any means. But uh, we can share our story and maybe help provide some motivation and some encouragement as everybody goes through their transformation of trying to make youth sport and uh, in their culture a little bit better for the kids that do participate. In 2008, um, we, we finalized our ADM plan, and really all that meant is that we got the advice from Ms. Vaughn and Steve uh, on how to apply long-term athlete development uh, and, and kind of hockeyize it and whatever that meant. Uh, so that it, we could apply it to our youth hockey system that we had. Um, and, and then we finished that in late December. And it was interesting because the NHL was coming out of a lockout. The NHL understood they had to grow fans. They wanted, they wanted to grow their fan base, win some fans back. But also they wanted more Americans playing in the National Hockey League long term since the majority of their franchises are in the United States. Uh, so we submitted that plan actually to our board of directors but also to the National Hockey League. In early 2009, uh, is one of the critical turning points for us is we received an NHL grant to support the, um, the ADM. The, our ADM proposal, uh, we realized we, to this point, we had never had anybody focused on recruitment or uh, new membership um, uh, development. So we were able with that grant to start a membership development department and also to hire uh, some regional managers. 
So that grant obviously was very significant um, in, in us launching. We were going to launch whether we got that grant or not, uh, but it did provide us some financial resources to help subsidize with those two critical components of, of our launch. So where are we now? Um, obviously, the American Development Model, we have the partnership with the National Hockey League, and we do b sincerely believe it's a brighter future for everybody. We believe it's a win-win-win. Um, our, our mantra here is uh, focus on the root, not the fruit. We believe that if we do a good job with our youth uh, recruitment and with our uh, player development, we'll retain more players and also uh, applying age-appropriate uh, age-specific training and programming, then we'll, we'll benefit at the top end of the pyramid. Obviously, this was a very significant uh, change in, uh, in our train of thought, um, and not everybody bought in within our own system or even within, uh, within our own organization. But we, we did get the board of directors to support it, and we got the National Hockey League to support it. Um, so we looked around and we said, okay, what, what changes really do we have to make? Um, so we recognized other sports had been, um, you know, downsizing or, or applying an age-appropriate or age-specific playing surface to fit the individual player and to fit the, the younger player. But we hadn't. We were still putting little tiny kids in the, in the adult environment. And as you can see, this picture shows a little kid trying to, trying to defend a goal that's the adult size goal. Picture to the right kind of shows... Um, this is actually a picture that I took in Slovakia where they have multiple uh, smaller nets depending on the age group. Uh, that was huge uh, change of, of mindset, huge change of thought, and uh, the practicality of what was going on in our ranks in the United States. So we started to make recommendations to downsizing the playing environment and the equipment to our, uh, to our young players. We also made a very, very concerted effort to preach to our uh, constituents in our clubs that you have to make the experience special. When kids come to the rink, uh, we're competing with all kinds of influencing factors. You know, not just other hockey associations, we're competing with other sport organizations, you're competing with music, you're competing with video games, esports, all kinds of things. And so if you want kids to, uh, to have a good experience, you have to make it special and you have to go out. And a, a couple of pictures here, obviously the kid uh, with the hockey jersey on, a little Batman thing, you can see the smile on his face. To the far right there, um, <laughs> two goofy mascots, uh, but the kids love it, eat it up. And then in the middle there, it's kind of funny, this is a guy uh, during one of our tri hockey events, uh, he couldn't go on the ice and help, but it was apparent, and we did a little barbecue, and um, he went around the stands and passed out sausages and coffee and hot chocolate and stuff like that to the families. So just trying to make it special so that they, it's a memorable experience and they see it as something maybe a little bit different than any experience they've had with their kid to that point. Another big thing we, we, um, we realize is that our country's awfully big from coast to coast, border to border. Um, not everybody's going to buy in. We, at that time, we had about uh, 3,000 youth clubs. And, um, you know, we have a very small staff relative to, to 50 states and 3,000 youth clubs. We couldn't possibly be everywhere uh, all the time. So um, we made a concerted effort to, to surround ourselves with people on the same mission with, as us. Um, and, and then we also made a concerted effort to, to uh, work with the ones that wanted to be worked with. The naysayers or the people that weren't on board, we let them just keep doing what they're doing. And, uh, but we were going to help the ones that wanted to be helped. We were going to be involved and very active with those that wanted to be helped. We, um, with, like I said, with the NHL grant, this is where we are today. This is, this is by no means where we started. But these are our regional managers. Most of them live out in the field, work from home, um, are in the ice rinks every night, talking to parents, jumping on the ice, doing demonstrations. Uh, you can see even though that you know one guy or one female – covers the entire country. One female covers the entire country for female programs. But you can see Joe Bonnet, who's based here in Colorado Springs, he's got all the way from the Canadian border in Seattle all the way down to, to Texas. So huge geographic regions. These guys are traveling a lot. Um, and then, um, you know, we're just trying to do the best we can. And obviously we're not in every single rank, but we are in the ones where people want, to, want us to be there. Um, where are we now? 
We are laser focused on our recruitment program. As I said before, we didn't have a recruitment program in the early 2000s. We, we just let the local clubs uh, take on the responsibility and figure out how to recruit uh, and get kids to come to their own clubs. Um, we took a, a, a national approach to that, created resources to help support those local clubs, but we also did a few things that I'll talk about a little bit later specifically um, to focus on recruitment. Uh, Age-specific programming, that's obviously our American development model, and then a huge initiative in our uh, coach education and parent information. Our recruitment program, this is a little snapshot of where we are today. Um, uh, prior to, um, to getting involved in the, in the hockey business as a hockey director and club director um, a long time ago, after I got out of school, I worked for Procter & Gamble, and I was taught that um, actually new customer acquisition is the most important thing in the world. And if you're not, uh, if you're not growing, you're dying. And if, for us, recruitment and growing the game and growing our membership is the, is the base of our success. Without that, uh, we're not going to have the success we potentially have. Um, so we started this in 2009. Um, today, uh, we have a total of about 850 sites, host sites, um, where we conduct try hockey for free with a, um, uh, with a local facility or a local club. And since the inception of this program, we've had more than 153,000 families that have uh, had their first hockey experience through this program. We provide marketing materials and a toolkit uh, to help promote this to all the, 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 uh, the families and the kids that come and try. And this year we'll have about 25,000 new families that will try, try hockey um, through this. And it's, it's all volunteer driven. We provide some resources, we provide some templates, best practices, but it's all done at the local level. Key programming components, obviously, are age-appropriate training, uh, more efficient practice plans. We, we got more aggressive and active, and for this group, the, the um, coach educators, um, we took it upon ourselves instead of sitting back, and, and we created uh, season plans and, and practice plans that we provided no charge uh, on our website, uh, on an app that we created, so that that basic parent, dad, coach, uh, mom, coach, maybe not a lot of experience, could just download those and run those. Our our goal is to sh just be able to show, hey, this is a template, this is a this is a recommendation. But if you if if you have better ideas, um, then you can customize it on your own. Obviously, um, we we have a heavy heavy focus on on off ice training. Part of that is creating better athletes, hitting windows of trainability. Um, because we have a, a strong philosophy that better athletes make better hockey players, and there's a minimal, minimal cost to the, to the off-ice component. And then obviously in our sport, body checking, body contact's a key component, so we want to do a better job of educating mom and dad that it can be done safely, and then also educating coaches on how they can implement into their practices, and also teaching the kids how to do that better. And then goaltending. We have a saying in our sport that the team that gets off the bus with the best goalie usually wins. So uh, obviously that's a key key program that that we started. So there, like we said, it wasn't it hasn't been easy, and there's been some extremely bold program changes that our uh, our staff has recommended to our board. Our board through uh, uh, long drawn out processes of debate um, and, um, and and discussion over periods of time as long as uh, two, three years before passing at the board of directors level. But we finally mandated uh, cross ice hockey, which is probably the most drastic change that we've made to our sport is instead of five to eight year olds playing the two, the full size NHL sheet that the pros play on. Um, we've mandated that they play cross ice, uh, cross ice hockey and use a lightweight puck. Um, for a lot of you guys, that probably doesn't sound too dr dramatic or drastic, but I can tell you that um, um, it was one of the biggest changes that we've made and huge issues. We were, cha we were wrecking the game. We're ruining the game. My kid needs to learn the, the offsides and faceoffs and all these different rules. How will they ever learn? Um, but when we looked around to other countries though, that were ahead of us in those standings, the Swedens, the Finlands, the Czech Republics, ahead of us in standings, they all played that way, and they actually played that way through 10 years old. Um, so we made, we, we made the bold step to make it to 8 years old, but 
um, it has been a, a, a huge battle, um, but it's, we believe it's the right thing for kids that age. We removed body checking from 12U, and we thought the cross-ice initiative was tough. Well, the body checking thing was even tougher because it was at the core of our game, and it was, um, you know, we, we were accused of wussifying our game, of changing our game. Everyone was going to quit. They were going to leave. They were going to go to outside organizations such as AAU who were sitting on the sidelines praying. When we made these rule changes, they were sitting on the sidelines waving their recruitment flag saying, hey, come play with us. We play real hockey. We play real hockey. We don't change it. We don't play baby hockey. Um, so we had those battles, and um, um, I think we're, we're coming out the other side in a better, better shape and a better game for these kids. We discontinued national championships for our 12 and under category. Another huge change, but we wanted to uh, – we understood that people started to aggregate uh, players and aggregate teams uh, of the best players and started to cut and discard the lesser players they, because they, in every community they were focusing on that run at a 12U national championship or even a state or a district championship. And so we wanted to slow down that, uh, that chaos and that race to the wrong, what we considered the wrong finish line. So another huge undertaking, tons of backlash, um, and um, fortunately, we think we've come out on the other on the other side in a better place as well. Um, mandated additional coach education and online modules. We already had mandated coach education clinics where all of our coaches had to go um, to a, a, a minimum one day clinic um, for our level one, two, and three, and then our level fours was a two and a half day clinic in person. Um, relative to the European countries, not a lot of coach education requirement, quite frankly. But then we added on these online modules, and the online modules were age-specific programming in our recommendation. And those online modules were took at least eight hours to complete. Now, you could log on and log off. Those had to be done by the, halfway through the season, December 31st. But another, we, we charged $10 for those. We were accused it was a money grab. Um, but quite frankly, it was the way, one of the key ways we were going to get our message out on what our actual recommendations were, why we were making these changes, and why we saw each of these age groups as being so um, specific in our recommendations for player development in those age groups. So critical components of, of our American development model, and these are the, the, some of the input from Ms. Von Baye and Steve Norris, but Eight stages of long-term athlete development, I can tell you uh, there probably wasn't 1% of our coaches in the United States or even our staff that were talking about stages of long-term athlete development. Nobody talked about windows of trainability. We didn't talk about biological age versus chronological age. And that the last bullet point, quite frankly, went over um, my head when we were in Calgary of system, system uh, alignment. Uh, and integration. Um, we focused on the sports science, and once we got the sports science stuff put together and, and rolled out, the system alliance and then the integration um, in some parts of the country was actually the most difficult part um, of, of actually you'll have clubs or teams or coaches that want to um, hit these windows of trainabilities with their programming, um, but the system in which they participated didn't always allow that. Um, so that was a kind of came out of left field for us and was way more difficult than we might have anticipated. Uh, some of the, the, you know, it's not real complicated. I know a lot of you guys do this in your sport, but we just gave options on different ways to use the, use the rank, use the facility, and actually help drive the cost down. Just station-based practices, more activity, more involvement, more repetitions for the kids. Modern practice plans we talked about, we provided these every age group, um, all the way from beginner, learn to skate, all the way up to uh, our 18U national teams. Implementation and communication. I know there's a lot on this slide, but uh, the left-hand column is, is kind of our communication approach uh, that helped us roll out and communicate to moms, dads, and parents. Uh, USA Hockey Magazine, we're lucky that we have every single, uh, every single member, every single player we have their parents' registration because they have to register online through our, our national organization in order to be a member of the local association. And so we have the home address, emails, phone numbers, those things. So we, can, we mail them a, a magazine to their house every month. 
Um, we developed admkids.com uh, as a freestanding website to um, have uh, all the information, the stage documents, the recommendations, the practice plans, videos, uh, even endorsements from NHL coaches, NHL players, spokespeople for the program. Uh, it was a way for us to get the information out. Uh, a lot of that information also lived on our USA Hockey uh, website. Uh, Age-specific emails, probably as big of an initiative as we, as we had in order to communicate to parents. And the age-specific email, so if I had a 10-year-old kid, I would get the 10-year-old email. And those, were, um, those emails went out every three weeks to mom and dad through, the, through their emails um, so that they were receiving the communication directly from our national office as to what was appropriate, what was recommend, recommended for that age kid, and why. So we'd mix in a little sports science, we'd mix in some programming, and we'd mix in uh, some endorsements from, um, from, like I said, NHL known players, Olympi Olympians, national team players, so forth. Um, Age-specific brochures. Those were hard copy brochures that we would distribute at events or they could be emailed to people as well. Uh, we distributed facility posters with our recommendations uh, to every rink in the United States. Some of those got put up, some didn't. Uh, we did podcasts, we had YouTube uh, videos, and we, uh, we tried to utilize Twitter to promote these other things as well. <clears throat> the other column are our coaches clinics, club visits, which are, I believe, critical. So the coaching clinics and club visits, those are in-person opportunities to talk to people, answer questions, debunk any myths that might be out there. Um, and then we, we actually did practice demos with our staff. We go out, run practices, off-ice, on-ice practices, talk to parents, yeah, actually put coaches through a lot of these age-specific stuff for younger kids, let them get a sense of what it's really like. Uh, parent meetings, in-person parent meetings. We ran a club, created a club director certification program um, for our hockey directors, and then a leadership program and our club excellence program, um, which I know we've worked with a lot of other organizations on the call here today um, to kind of get ideas from so that we're providing best practices to those uh, volunteer boards of each of our clubs that are out there and giving them a calendar, giving them templates for letters, mailings, promotional materials, um, roles and responsibilities of each of those volunteer positions on the board to make it easy for volunteers. So what are a little uh, of the results, the positives from, from these e efforts? Um, the retention is up. ADM early adopters uh, at the eight and under category more likely to grow. Uh, the adopt early adopters are 43% more likely to retain kids than the non-adopters. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this tweet. Um, I asked Sam actually if I would offend anybody by putting this uh, on the slide today, but as you can see, um, participation for kids from 6 to 12 from 2011 to 2016, um, hockey's up 23.3%. We like to credit the efforts of the ADM and our um, youth department staff, our, our development uh, department, our PR department as uh, being responsible for some of this positive growth during, as we all know, a really difficult time uh, in youth sports, especially team sports, and especially uh, contact sports. Um, so last year we had record numbers. We had record numbers in our eight and under with 116,000 uh, eight and under kids registered. Record number of adults, so those are adult recreational players. We've identified that a lot of times mom and dad start playing, and if they fall in love with the game and they enjoy it, even though they've never played before, that they may be more inclined to sign their kids up to try hockey. There are also going to be a lot of our volunteers, our coaches, our referees, our scorekeepers, timekeepers, volunteer board members, those type of things. So that, that number is important to us, and we continue to have efforts to grow adult recreational hockey. The other thing is they can use the facilities at the non-prime time times. That, that helps those facilities be successful and keep the cost down overall. And then the record number of overall players uh, at, at all ages, and that's due to growth and retention. Um, remarkably, last year, every single one of our age groups was up um, in, in retention. So uh, to me, that's an indication that we're doing a little bit better job. So what's the business impact here? So you can see on the total youth here from seven to eight, uh, we actually grew a little bit, about 9%. At the eight and under, we grew about 27%. So what's the financial impact? Well, at the eight and under, it's significant. It's almost a million dollars a year more that revenue that we're bringing in with that type of growth at our $40 uh, 
uh, per player. And then for the total youth, it's over 1.1 million, almost 1.2 million uh, annual financial impact additional. So that's fine. We're okay right now. Um, we've had a, a little splash of some positive stuff. Um, but as I try to lead our staff and our department is that we, we can't sit on our laurels. Um, my goal is to be run a world leading youth sport um, organization. Uh, and we don't have any excuses at this point. We have the backing of the National Hockey League. We have stats and data that shows if we stick to our guns and we do the right thing, we put kids first and their, their interests first, um, that we can have positive results. So we don't have any excuses. My mantra and for, for all of us here in, in our office is if it's important, we'll find a way. If not, we'll find an excuse. And there's a whole bunch of excuses that we can make. Um, I have a saying, it's, it's simple, not easy. Um, and we have to stick to our guns. We have to be convicted. We have to be educated, knowledgeable about what we're trying to do. Um, but we, we, can't, we can't have any excuses. Um, to be world leading, I see is, uh, these are our, our four bullet points here is recruitment is first and foremost. It's our, it's our number one priority. We have to provide better programming, uh, focus on the individual child versus uh, team wins and championships, those types of things. Uh, uh, that's supported by age appropriate and age specific programming. Uh, and then we have to do a really good job and, and, and we can do better in every single one of these areas. We, we have a lot of flaws in our system right now and we're, we're constantly striving to improve and be better tomorrow than we've, we've ever been. Um, our communication and education efforts with our parents and our coaches, uh, we can do a real good job with recruitment and a, and a decent job with programming. But if we don't communicate to our parents and our, and our coaches and, and constantly work on training our coaches to provide a good environment, a good experience, then the recruitment and the programming will fall short. And then our in-person visits, club visits and demos, uh, obviously uh, the most significant thing we can do is to get out in front of people, talk to them face to face. We can't expect other people to do it for us. We can't just rest on social media and online stuff. Um, we've got to get out there and get in front of them. Um, and, and it's boots on the ground and it's constant effort. And as we say, it's not, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's not always easy to be at the rink at the, in the, in the evening after work hours or on the weekends and, and give up holidays and weekends. But, um, if you're really serious and you're dead serious about uh, doing the best job we can do, that's what it'll take to do. So, um, that's my presentation. Hopefully there's some, um, some information that's, um, will help you and support your efforts. Um, my slide here normally ends with it's a great day for hockey, but I truly believe with the efforts of what the USOC is doing and the leadership they're providing, uh, the leadership all of you guys are providing within your sports, if we ever get this thing really rocking and rolling um, and, and collaborating with amongst different sports, um, all, of our, all of our youth sports are going to benefit and um, all of our lives are going to be easier and most importantly, the kids are going to benefit and they're going to have a more positive experience. Uh, during their youth. Hey Kevin, thanks a lot. Um, got a few questions coming in, but I, I'm going to start with one that um, I'm involved in because I'm also now in a club-based sport. And some early pushback I'm getting is from folks who say, well, you know, if 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 Johnny goes over and plays hockey for a season, I'm and, and hockey probably. Not a good example because you guys are going to send them back, but they go play another sport for a season. You know, is that sport going to try to keep them permanently in that sport and not, you know, encourage them to come back to fencing? Or, um, you know, if they go off and try something, um, you know, other sports may not be or other club owners may not be as into this as we are. What was some of your uh, techniques you guys used to help? Uh, club and ice rink owners kind of overcome that mindset. No doubt, that is uh, that's a prevalent mindset that's out there. I think it gets back to um, actually the messaging and communication. You have to let parents know that if you want to be an elite hockey player, you need to take time off and go play other sports and then come back to hockey. It also is a responsibility of ours and the clubs to make it special. 
Uh, do it. I mean, you got to think crazy. You got to think out of the box. You got to think. I got to appeal to seven, eight year olds, so they're t- tugging at mom and dad's uh, coattails to say, when do I get to go back to to hockey, or when do I get to go back to whatever sport that is. I think it's also imperative, and it and it reiterates strongly. Uh, the messaging has to come from the USOC, has to come from the professional sports organizations, and it has to come from all of us um, working together so that the pro sports organizations, the U.S. Olympic Committee, and the national governing bodies, we need to do joint messaging so that people understand multiple sports participation will benefit you in whatever your primary and sport is that you're most passionate about or that you're maybe you're most genetically inclined to succeed at. Um, and then we all just have to understand that, you know what, not all of them are going to stick in our sport and in our club, and that's why recruitment is, is critical. And if I'm going to lose two, three, four, five kids, um, you know, I better be bringing in ten. Well, one of the philosophical arguments I make is that if we really are truly looking out what's best for the kid and the kid really wants to go play the other sports, isn't that what we want to have happen anyway? And, you know... <laughs> Right. Sort of put the bonus on, like, oh, okay, who's this about? Is it about you or the, you know, the ten-year-old kid who's standing there in front of you? Uh, with that. Right. A um, couple of uh, comments, questions here. Um, can you share some examples of the promotions or communication templates that uh, hockey has used? Um, I can. Um, for one of my favorites is. Um, Halloween, um, what our marketing department did, what, what, I thought it was pretty smart. What they did in the, in, in the um, uh, membership department is they asked best practices of our club, and they asked people to offer up what their best recruitment program has been. One of those was uh, a Halloween promotion. So kids go trick-or-treating, and you know, young kids go trick-or-treating with their parents. So what we did is um, developed a, a template, a card, it's almost like a business card or a, a, a flyer card, an index card. That um, So when they came and knocked on your door, uh, everybody in the hockey club had these. And when they're passing out candy, they drop candy in and they drop this little uh, index card that had information about try hockey for free or come try skating, come try hockey, um, so that all those little kids that went trick-or-treating at all of our members' houses um, in you know, age, pretty good target market for the age group, um, they now had uh, contact and, and direct information about your hockey program. That's brilliant. Um, and maybe, uh, Mary, maybe you can reach out to Kevin and get some examples from him on some of the templates that he's used. Uh, another question is, uh, did you guys replace your under-12 national championships with any kind of a development camp or other opportunities for the under-12 crew? No, uh, we didn't. We didn't at all, and we were, we were, you know, everybody said, oh, somebody's going to jump in there, AAU will jump in, and they'll run, they'll run a 12U Nationals, and people have tried to do it. Um, for-profit uh, entrepreneurs have tried to do it, um, and it, it just hasn't taken off. I, I, I have a, um, I think, a, a glass is half full perspective that parents know first and foremost what's age appropriate for their kids. Now, are there that segment of the population that think their 12-year-old needs to go to nationals? Absolutely. However, do most parents, if it's not there and it's not put in front of them and it's not the next step on the ladder for their their league or their state or their club, um, then and, and we communicate efficiently and proactively as to why we're not doing that, um, then... Um, um, you know, I think it's been successful. I think people have accepted it. Um, there's still some outliers that want to do it, um, but the majority has understood why we canceled it and why we, why we don't think it's age appropriate. And you know, we're we're still okay with state championships, um, but the, we we preach the sports science. We talk about age appropriateness. We talk about winning the race to the right finish line. Um, and we just have to over over communicate that message, and um, you know communicate what our philosophy is and why we make those decisions. And, and we, Sam, we can't be steered by the vocal minority. We can't be steered by the loud dad in the stands that had an older kid or he's got the early physical mature. We can't let that person have a louder voice than what our voice is. 
Well, and, and I think I've mentioned this to you before. If, if when you when you do away with a national championship in an age group, it, you know, after two or three years, there's nobody. I mean, people aren't going to remember it. They may go, "Oh yeah, we used to have a U12 national championship," but then the question would be, if there's no clamoring to bring it back, then it's really not being missed, right? Right. Right. Um, you know, if if AAU could pull it off and they had, you know. 50,000 kids doing it, then you go, okay, there was really a desire there. But uh, my guess is most parents look at it and go, oh, my God, i got to pay for another trip somewhere across the country. Right. <laughs> Thank right. you for saving me thousands of dollars. Yep. Um, that's an argument that I try to make anyway with parents. Absolutely. Um, one more question here, and I think this will be the last one uh, here, and it's a, it's a really good one that uh, popped into my head as well. When you guys were creating the ADM template for USA Hockey, did you model it off the Canadian model, then adjust it for the U.S., or is this standalone programming model? No, it's it's well, I don't know if standalone is the right term. It, all we did was follow uh, long-term athlete development um, guidelines, so it's not sports-specific. Um, uh, Quite frankly, at the time, Hockey, Hockey Canada was one of the only governing bodies that didn't have a long-term athlete development plan. Um, yeah, I would recommend there's um, – I, I went through this with fencing, is looking at the Canadian uh, Fencing uh, Association's long-term athlete development plan. UK, uh, a lot of the UK countries or UK sports have also – done their LTAD stuff is, I, you know, I'm a believer in looking at that and saying, oh, what can we use and what makes sense for us? And uh, and like you said, probably 80% of it uh, would be cross-sport. You could just generically dump it in and then put in the specifics that we needed to add for, for fencing. And, and they're, um, you know, they're available online. Sometimes it requires maybe a little bit of digging on the, on the Canadian and the UK sites. But um, but it, it's it's findable for sure. Yeah. Well, we found what we found, Sam, is that um, when you took the recommendations um, from LTAD and the windows of trainability, and you applied them to hockey, normally at the bottom of our age groups, so the younger age groups, uh, we were telling people to slow down a little bit, uh, don't get ahead of yourself, and then when we got up to uh, 11 and older, 12 and older. It was, you guys actually have to do more. I mean, again, win the race to the right finish line. And so initially rinks, uh, ice rinks, the facilities, which are, you know, we're a facility-driven sport, and they were saying, well, you're telling kids to go play other sports and not play so much, you're, you're going to wreck my business. And we said, well, well read, the, read the whole paper, you know. <laughs> don't, just, don't just read the first paragraph. Read the whole paper because actually – uh, for them to train and, and get the ice time they needed at the top end uh, in the older age groups, they they needed to do more training at the rink. Well, I think that's a good sales pitch for the for the club folks too. Is that if that works out for every sport that, yeah, you the eight year olds may not be here as much, but when they're fourteen, they're going to be here a little bit more. And yep. and, and yep. in fencing, we're you know it's a lesson based sport as well, where you're paying for lessons. And that's where the coaches are making their money on those lessons that they're giving um, to the fencers. So at least again, our sport and, and a bunch of other sports, tennis. You know, it's tennis lessons. That's what you pay for. Um, yeah, kind you know. of an un unintended consequences in ice hockey is that because we've we've uh, focused on the individual player and skill development, all that. There there has been uh, an increase in people out there uh, promoting private lessons and private individual skill lessons and. You know, um, we cautiously, um, you know, try to educate parents of there's a time and a place, um, and, and, you know, there's some are better than others, but um, you don't have to spend it. You don't have to go broke with private lessons and when you're five to ten years old on private lessons. Yeah. Well, that, that makes me think of the Nova Scotia uh, Meet the Parents uh, realm as they're sitting around uh, uh, sharing that about sort of the private lessons thing. So I, I yeah. saw that video from Nova Scotia. Yeah. All right. Um, seeing no more questions in the pipeline, uh, first of all, Kevin, thank you very much for sharing the USA Hockey experience and, and uh, the ADM and implementation. And thanks, everyone, for joining on the call. 
Uh, again, the next one will be in January with uh, Jean Cote, and uh, of course, I'll send out reminders to folks. And I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. Thanks, Anne. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, everybody.